Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is G.A. Bradshaw. She's the founder and director of the Kerulo Center for Nonviolence, www.kerulos.org. She holds doctorate degrees in ecology and psychology and a master's in geophysics and is the author of Elephants on the Edge, What Animals Teach Us About Humanity, Yale University Press 2009, and Carnivore Minds, who these fearsome animals really are, Yale University Press 2017. Her new book is Talking with Bears, Conversations with Charlie Russell, Rocky Mountain Books coming out in April. So first off, thank you for your wonderful work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Of course. So I want to start by asking you, I mean, this conversation with Charlie Russell. So tell me about Charlie Russell, and tell me about bears, and I'm thinking especially of this quote by Charlie from the new book, Talking with Bears, Quote, people say in order to understand someone, you have to love them. I think that's probably why I can understand bears a little, because I love them. Understanding someone means you care about them. Learning becomes something that isn't just about you, collecting facts for your own purpose. It's about seeing the world through their eyes and getting to know what is important to them. For me, that seems like one of the most important quotes one could ever have about living on this planet. Actually, it does. It encapsulates... Um, Charlie's philosophy um, and what I would call his science, which is his way of, of seeing and, and living in the world. And I think it also is reflective of what science with a capital S, Western science, has found from the perspective of things like quantum, quantum physics and consciousness studies, where everything is based on relationship. And so when he talks about love, he is speaking specifically about the relational nature of living on this planet and in his interactions and in his uh, experience with bears. And, and although Charlie is known as the bear guy as such, um, you know, that was, it was much more expansive because he, he had a tremendous affinity for bears and, and there's a particular reason that he became, quote unquote, a bear guy as such, but he really was um, very much uh, nature, and nature was him. He was born and raised, uh, just to give you a little bit of a biographical kind of a context, he was born and raised in um, Alberta, Canada, in the, um, the, the mountains there in the Front Range. Uh, he was born in the 40s, and he died actually just, uh, it'll be two years this, this spring. Um, so he lived until his 70s, and his grandfather was a pioneer, came from Britain, and basically worked on the land and developed an outfitting where they would have people coming, typically rich Americans coming from back east, would want to go hunting or going out in nature, and they had these long pack trains. And his grandfather was a very big figure, as was his, his grandmother. And then Charlie's father uh, took over that business. So Charlie grew up as we would call sort of a pioneer, and he had siblings, but a very important uh, shift came for him in terms of the rest of his family as well as what we would call the majority of individuals living in that area in that he saw through his experience with grizzly bears that their perception, the way they were perceived, the way the narrative, the stories, even the stories he grew up with as his father w did not fit his own experiences. And so... Charlie, for whatever reason, you know, in the in the book, I do describe some, you know, experiences he had as a child, um, which I think is valid. This happens with a lot of individuals who we call geniuses or, you know, people who um, come up with some kind of insight, which is very much out of the box. Um, you have, you know, someone like Mozart or you have someone like Charles Darwin, um, Krishnamurti, and, um, in fact, a psychiatrist did a study on them, and, and it was basically an individual gains these insights, or at least it's correlated with that, because of a, typically it's an early onset experience where they 
no longer are sort of subjected to the social conditioning, which means kind of getting on the conveyor belt of education and being in this Western civilization society. And uh, Charlie was, you know, brought up essentially in this constellation of his grandfather and grandparents and his family. <clears throat> but then he had an experience which basically, and a continued experience with the formal education system, which he just was, it just, you know, was essentially incompatible. And so he grew up that area. It was, you know, full of grizzlies, um, but then quickly dwindled because when white settlement came in, they extirpated, meaning they killed them all. Um, same with the Indians. And essentially, Charlie just started a different relationship of, of living with nature. So just over time, one of the kind of precipitating moments of why he fixated on grizzlies was his father got a grant to do a study, um, um, I think it was the Wildlife Conservation Society, to do a documentary on grizzlies. And they went up to Alaska, and they had all this heavy equipment. And at one point, he said they stopped carrying guns, partly it's because they're so damn heavy. All the camera equipment at that time was really... And what he saw, and what they saw, is that the popular um, picture of grizzlies, which was maintained today, is you know this bloodthirsty, unpredictable maniac, and you have to be on your toes, otherwise you're going to be wiped out. And that was something that he saw was radically different. And this was a consistent pattern for Charlie in terms of other things that he heard from people, whether it was from his family or whether it was from you know in the larger society, is what he experienced in what we call nature and life did not jive in in any sort of way. So. Charlie, um, basically, it became uh, a passion of his to really understand, and he makes a distinction between studying something, someone, and understanding something or someone, studying bears versus understanding. And that relates to that quote uh, in terms of the understanding, is that the this is where he definitely parts ways with traditional, conventional science, biology, etc., um, his goal is not to find and extract and to study. His is to understand um, someone he cares about. And in a, and in a sense, it's almost less about them than it is him. So he's tried to understand the bears um, so that he can be a good neighbor. He can be a good person. He can... Um, live well with them and do the right things. And that was really his oh, sort of overarching um, principle that he, he followed throughout his life. So if, he, if, if the common understanding of grizzly bears is that they're these ferocious, terrifying creatures... And before we go on, I want to say, you know, when I'm, I, I mentioned to you before we started, and, and people who know me know this, that, that I see black bears every day, and the, I also walk through a forest every day. And the most common question I get about that is, aren't you terrified? And I always say, no, actually, not at all. I mean, I'm, I have been more nervous when I've seen humans walking through the forest than when I see bears, honestly. And then the other thing is that um, the bears have less reason, have more reason to fear us than we have to fear them because I've known bears who've had members of their direct family killed and none of my members of my family have been uh, killed by humans and mm -hmm. none of my members of my family have been killed by bears mm -hmm. um, anyway so so with that little thing so so what 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 was his uh, different perception of grizzly bears than these these maniacs well the first thing is that he found that they by his own experience that they were not they were curious um, they were gentle um, and and he's not alone. If you look at, uh, like I mentioned, my my in this new book I'm working. I bring in the work, and I do in there in terms of John Muir and e Enos Mills. Uh, Enos Mills is less, perhaps less familiar. He was sort of one of the architects of Rocky Mountain National Park. And both his writing and John Muir's, um, they they very much came into, and so did Charlie. Even though he was born and raised in this area they really came into the woods in the mountains as guests and in the sense of you know non-proprietorial they would they would go in there as guests and as a guest 
um, just like when we go to a different culture or a different town, the proper, <laughs> at least it used to be, the proper way is um, you listen and you pay attention. You know, what are, what are the rules? You know, what are people's values, et cetera? And so that is kind of the way Charlie was wired. And what he found is, you know, grizzlies can kill. I mean, they can do a lot of damage. They're very powerful individuals. But they barely ever do that with a human, ever. And he found that they were more curious and um, open and friendly. And they were doing their job. I mean, it's not easy to live in the wildlife. You can't just, like, turn on, turn on and off a refrigerator or, you know, go down to the store. I mean, their job is their life, so they have to, you know, they've got better things to do than, than talking with humans, and yet they were very interested in opening to those relationships. So that was such, so, such a dramatic contrast to this myth, which he, you know, it was a myth, which has been promulgated. And, you know, we've talked about it, and I, I know a lot of other people have written about it, the people who came to... North America, at least in this first major wave, uh, were white Europeans from the UK, and they've wiped out all the the bears. They've wiped out all the wolves. There's all these stories, Little Red Riding Hood. People have talked about that. So this myth was brought here, uh, and the agenda that went with it. And you know, you could go into the deep psychology of, you know, that these, you know, my carnivore minds actually does that where they can kill a human, but they very, very, very rarely do. Bears, wolves, and you name it, anything with teeth and claws and jaws. Um, they very rarely do it. But in the human psyche of the European, Euro-American, whatever you want to call it, um, it was that possibility that created this myth. And, um, and, and you know, like I said, you can analyze it in terms, of, and you've written about that, you know, that we are superior and... You know, we need to feel superior, therefore we need to feel like we can wipe these animals out even though we don't have to. So Charlie's experience was completely different, and that's also the way he was wired. He was a very gentle person. He was tough. If you talk to people, they say he was incredibly tough, um, and he had incredible endurance, and I would qualify that, that endurance is the, of the kind he had wasn't that you bite a bullet. Sometimes you have to, and, like, it's really cold, it's really hard. But it was, uh, um, in, a, in a profound way, um, a philosophy as a, of acceptance, very similar to you might think about in, in Buddhism, where he accepts nature, and he accepts the elements, and he accepts the way things are, um, not to fight nature, but to learn about nature, of which humans are, but to learn, as you would with a neighbor, and... Um, you know, and if there, if if you have hardship, well, then you've misjudged. <laughs> you know, your expectations and goals were not commensurate with those of quote unquote nature. Um, but neither he, Mills, or or Muir ever made a big deal out of it. It was they they, they took there was an accountability, and there was a real sense of humility, um, which is natural because all of the animals that I know in the wild um, are very humble. They, they they don't make a big deal out of stuff. They don't have to be, you know, dominating or, or anything like that. So that was really um, what Charlie's mission was all his life, was accumulating more and more understanding. Um, whenever there was, like, an incident, you know, someone getting killed by a grizzly, he would investigate it um, very thoroughly. He never made assumptions. He was self-examining all the time, all the time. Um, and as he said... It's not that I have to be right, but what's wrong with being right? If I wasn't right living in the woods, I'd be dead. So he functioned very much like what I describe and, and um, by the mores of, of nature. Um, I'm going to read another quote from him, and then after the quote, I'm going to ask you f for some examples of to pr sort of bring all this home. Anyway, here's the quote. Um, People insist that it is dangerous if a bear loses fear of humans, becomes habituated. It's bad news, they say, if a bear becomes comfortable around humans. That's why people are told to make all sorts of noise if they see a grizzly. Not just to scare her off, but to make sure that no connection is made with the bear. I think that's so crucial. My experience shows just the opposite, that being fearful in that way is not normal for a bear. You can't feel negative or superior because fear causes hostility. Scaring a bear is threatening, and that makes him defensive. Being fearful is all about the human, not about the bear. 
Most of the time in nature there's nothing to fear if you pay attention. Bears and other animals pick up on whether someone is scared or interested in them in a good way. They like it when someone is genuinely interested in them. I've called it intelligent responsiveness. So A, I just love that. B, if you want to comment on that, that's great. And then C, I'm wondering if we can also uh, sort of ground the discussion that we've had so far in some tangible examples of some stories of human bear in, of of human bear interactions that are that are different than than just being terrified. Well, <clears throat> um, I'll I'll say a few things about the fear component, uh, and we Charlie goes into that quite a bit, and we discuss that. And, and you can think about your own experience. It doesn't have to be with with non humans. It can be with with humans. Is that if you, um, I mean, this has certainly been my experience, and, and, and I have to say that when I write, I'm always checking in terms of my own experience, even if I haven't been around bears like Charlie has, just in my own experience, quote-unquote, in nature. And the thing is, is that there's emotional contagion. If I walk into your room, and I'm on edge, and I'm feeling fearful, you pick it up. We see that all the time. You know, you go to a meeting, you go to a restaurant, whatever, and you walk in, it's like, ooh, it's palpable. Now, some people are more sensitive than others. So from Charlie's point of view, if a bear sees that you're afraid, it's like, okay, well, what, why is he afraid? What's going on? Um, because there's no reason. The bear does not have any intention of, it, of killing you or eating you. And, you know, you're not on the menu. There are times when bears do, like Timothy Treadwell. That was a bear that was... Um, you know, had a history of, it was very ill and was old and, and was obviously, you know, having some issues. Um, but these are, this is not the nor- quote-unquote normal thing. So, you know, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're setting the stage for quote-unquote something to happen. The bear goes, oh what's going on? You know, and then you're acting more fearful, and so it kind of amps up. As Charlie talks about, the natural sort of baseline is, and and we feel this way. I mean, for most people, unless you're totally urbanized, um, when you know, why do we like to go take walks on the beach? Why do why, why do veterans or people who've suffered tremendous violence from humans why do they enjoy? Why is going out, quote unquote, to nature so relaxing? Um, fear, as as Charlie makes a point, fear is important. It's very useful, but being fear informed as opposed to fear determined is a very different thing. And he talks about that the present um, attitudes and philosophy and instructions from the wildlife <coughs> agencies and from scientists is a fear-determined way. And as I do talk about in the book there, it's a, it's a circular argument. Um, bears, you know, grizzly bears, all bears, but particularly grizzlies, brown bears, are dangerous. They're unpredictable. And then that's a fact. But it's never been examined. <laughs> so you start with a baseline that's erroneous and then everything is based on that and so the whole thing is you know becomes a circular you know kind of almost a fate fate producing um outcome in that way. A joke I used to tell is that I would talk about walking, you know, going through the forest and there's bears and everybody's like, "Oh my gosh, you need to be so afraid of bears," which I'm not. And then I would point out that in North America there's one person dies every 2 years from a from a black bear attack or black bear, whatever we want to call it. And on the other hand, there's about 30,000 Americans die or 35,000 Americans die every year because of um, automobile crashes. So the truth is we should walk through a parking lot going, oh my God, this is terrifying. Um, right. Because that's way, way scarier than, I mean, more people die than, than die because of bears. Mm-hmm. And, and, and to me, that's a very good example. Um, in fact, in my carnivore minds, I make kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. If you look at the statistics of people falling in the house and dying in their house in a bathtub, that, you know, we should have, we should have regulations on rounding up all the bathtubs, you know. Um, but that's right there. And, and that attitude is promulgated by the wildlife agencies and the quote-unquote majority of, of animal and wildlife experts. And when you talk about this whole about the disconnection thing, that that's a very conscious effort on the parts of the agencies because hunting, fishing, all of these things are based are, are revenues which support these agencies. And there's a culture, it's an insular culture, which is threatened by ideas you know like like Charlie talks about. 
Um, so there is no scientific data, none of the science. Now, the incidents, which is what we did talk about a little bit, is, and you brought this up, is that, you know, all wildlife everywhere sort of technically has been psychologically and physiologically traumatized. If you look at trauma and stress as a differential between pre-colonial or however you want to call it and pre-colonial conditions and now, that differential is a rough estimate of the kind of stress and the kind of uh, trauma that these individuals have sustained psychologically and physiologically. And these are quote-unquote habitat change, um, killing, mass killing, uh, noise, disruption, um, you name it, anything that we've done in our civilization. So you are getting, um, and this is Charlie did start carrying bear spray, which is used as this turin, and he would most of the time forget it because they're, he, you know, he, he was like the most knowledgeable person in the sense of the most ease. But when you have someone who's severely traumatized, um, it's not unusual that they're going to respond, even though that, you know, it's natural. Most every bear, I assert that most every bear in, in North America, at least the coterminous United States and Alaska, and probably all of British Columbia, so I just said the whole damn thing, um, has witnessed their mother or another bear killed. And they've definitely been pursued. When, when, when a bear is killed, um, it's not infrequent that they see multiple bullets embedded in their body. I mean, from previous times, not that they, those, that was not necessarily the lethal bullets. This is just they've been shot at them. So we're essentially transmitting our traumatogenic culture into wildlife culture. So I've been doing these interviews, this, this program, every week for five years probably or somewhere in there. And I think I, I want you to say basically everything you've said, I want you to say it again because I think this is this is the most important point that's ever been made in this whole radio program. Um, and you don't really have to just repeat it, but let's emphasize this, that non-humans, I don't think just bears, I think basically every species yeah. out there is... I've said this for, for years, that, that when they do studies of wildlife behavior, they make, and then they d make deductions about what that means about wildlife behavior, that makes as much sense as doing a study of Russian citizens in World War II fleeing the Nazi panzers, how they behave, and then suggesting that has anything to do with how normal human behavior. Yeah. That basically every non-human on the planet, well, let's just say humans too, everybody on the planet yeah, at this point has... Traumatized has complex PTSD. Yes. And and I would say that this is a very pernicious thing within the human sphere, is that the um, architecture, you know, the, the rudiments of our culture, now culture and habits and social habits and things like that, um, have evolved to bring cohesion, to support, blah, blah, blah. And I would argue that practically every single aspect of our social and cultural hab, you know, what we want to call it our architecture of our civilization, this dominant thing, um, is traumatogenic. So, you know, for example, you know, everything we do is based on, you know, for example, like our rituals. You know, we get together for Thanksgiving. It's mass slaughter of these, of these turkeys that are tortured. And it is um, based on genocide of the turkeys. It's based on genocide of the Indians. I mean, every single rodeos. Um, I mean, these are more glaring kinds of things. But the reality is, is that you know our human-human relationships are such a mess. We don't have a sub. At least in my experience, one that I was talking with one of our board members today, we don't have a baseline of trust. So if I have an argument with you. Um, it's life and death in the sense of that we can't argue and then know that we are connected to each other and we're trying to solve something together. Um, so everything is very fracturing, everything is very wounding, everyone is very raw. And the animals are subjected to that. And every, I would say every species, by the definition that I said, and it's a very conservative way from a scientific perspective to characterize it. If you look, for example, at an elephant in a zoo, and then you look at the elephant 
um, in his or her quote-unquote natural environment, say in the savanna in Africa pre-colonial times. That differential is, again, an index of the trauma and the stress. And it doesn't even take into account, and again, this is all from a very conservative scientific point of view, it does not even take into account the, the longitudinal, the accumulation of trauma, which we call historic trauma, trauma transmission of intergenerational trauma. And so essentially we are in this reactive mode. And what Charlie used to talk about with the bears is like, it, and, and I see that with the other animals that I'm around, it's extraordinary that, they, that they're not attacking us all the time or that they're not... Um, yep you know, flipped out all the time, that they can actually, as Charlie would say, that they actually are still open to having a relationship with humans who are basically lethal to them. So that really speaks to the profound connection of, um, of, of, of animal consciousness to the substrate of, of life. Um, and there are, there are many, many, unfortunately, many, many examples. For example, parrots who are taken from the wild or, or, you know, captive bred and put in cages where they just are gone. They're just gone. You know, they self-mutilate, they commit suicide. Um, they do things like we do. And that's when, uh, the way I look at it is they, they, they've lost that anchor to the, the, the substrate of, of consciousness, which is nature's pulse in that way. Um, so, you know, that that is... True. I was going to say when you were talking about these experiments, there's a study, um, there was one in Sweden and one in this country, and I was really, I actually wrote a Psychology Day blog thing about it. I was really excited about it because it was a perfect example of the importance of looking from a <clears throat> psychological as opposed to a behavioral, ethological way of, of looking at animals. Um, and the psychological you can look at in a very conventional way. I typically look at it as psyche in the sense of all-encompassing consciousness from a depth <coughs> psychology like Jung. But it was a study where they were looking at black bears. I think it was somewhere in the Midwest. And they were looking at the effects of drones, you know, the little pic, you know, drones that take photos. And they're like, is this a disturbance to these bears in this wilderness area? <clears throat> and they had collars on the bears. And they're basically the study from that said no. There was one bear that got scared and ran away. The others just kind of looked up and, and went on and whatever. Well, then they looked at the um, physiological data from the collars, and they looked at, um, I guess, was it, I can't remember, was heart rate, I don't know if it was heart rate variability or, um, anyways, but basically what they found out from the, from the physiological is all the, on the outside the bears looked perfectly calm, except for this one bear, but when you looked at what was going on internally, they were off the charts absolutely off the charts in terms of stress. And, um, and that's a yeah. parallel study that happened, for example, I think, I think it was Bruce Perry's a psychiatrist that worked with children from Waco, is, you know, this is in the sort of the, after the thing blew up and they were monitoring the children, and the children like playing and everyone's fine. But when they looked at their heart rate variability, which is a, a, you know, kind of an index of stress, it was like down in the basement. You know, in other words, what we see on the outside is not telling what's happening on the inside. Well, I don't understand why they even had... I'm, I, I'm glad they did the study, I guess, but I don't even understand why they have to, because how would you feel if you're sitting there just hanging out, or maybe you're having a nice conversation with a friend, or you're just relaxing, and all of a sudden your neighbor ran a drone over your head? Yeah. Well, you know? I mean, I'm just saying is that they're, what they did, they were not, I interpreted what they were doing. They were looking at it in a much narrower way. But I liked it as a, pet, you know, a sort of a pedagogy, you know, a, a teaching yeah, yeah, moment. Yeah. Well, I'm not um, complaining about sense. you. No, 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 I'm, no, no. I'm, but I mean is, is that, of course, but you see what I'm saying is, is that yeah. the way that they look at it is it's like, well, why should they? And they, this was sort of, um, you know, I don't think they expect <laughs> They didn't expect this. But but again, you know, this is this is our disconnect. We objectify everyone. Um, you know, we say that elephant, oh, the elephant looks fine. Oh, that orca looks fine. You know, they're still having babies, or you know, they're still eating, or you know, and which is a total, you know, mis you know, misconstruing really what life is. So I have a a, a fairly long story I want to tell about bears. Good. And the reason the reason I see bears every day is is primarily because. I'm friendly to them, and there's there's a little bit of habitat here, and 
whenever other people in the neighborhood see bears, they chase them away, and I don't. And so it's a place they can rest, and they can sleep, and they can be happy. That's fine. Okay, so earlier this year, there was a mother with her baby who was hanging around, and um, the baby got killed by a male. And I'm going to say something about that in a second. What I'm saying about this currently is after that, the um, the female, when she would see the male, um, she would like slink right up next to the house and she actually would try to get in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and there were times when I opened the door and then I had to like be pushing the door shut against her and the point is, she is now, this is not, this is not to do with humans, it's going to in a second, but for now what this has to do with is that every time she saw this male who had killed her baby, she was traumatized and tried to get away. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, just, just like it would be with any human. I mean, right. that's what I'm trying to get across is that there, they are beings who, who feel fear, who feel, yeah. they get all the stuff we do. And then right. the larger picture, I started asking, so it doesn't make any ecological sense for a male to kill the baby that 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 how does this work on an ecological scale i was wondering because that's a tremendous amount of effort for the female if he caused her to spontaneously abort that wouldn't be so expensive for her if he chases off the yearlings that's not so expensive because they can live but this is a tremendous waste of the female energy and so then a friend of mine did the research on this and found out that in a normal, healthy, and this is the point, in a normal, healthy bear community, I always thought the females had territory and the males didn't. That's not true. A big male will have a meta-territory, and he basically keeps all of the young rogue males in line, and he makes sure that they don't kill the babies. But what happens is, if their larger community gets stressed out and some jerk shoots the big male bear, then all the younger bears start behaving very poorly all the young male bears and that's how it's no longer stable you see what i'm getting at I'm my sorry? point is that you, do you see what i'm getting at with this yeah 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 that, well, that's all just well i mean ahead, well, there's a couple of things that come out of it one is what you're talking about and this is definitely the case which i've, I've written about for example in, in about elephants in africa is that and i think it's writ large that um, the the baseline of quote unquote normal behavior, normal psych what I would call normal psychological state, but people don't talk about that in animals, but it is psychological because behavior is only one component, right? Um, so that in the example I told you is the bear looks fine. In other words, the bear's behavior conforms to relaxed behavior, but inside that's the psychological, right? Right? You know. So, anyways. Um, that the baseline is already you're looking at uh, a very disturbed and traumatized population because of the mass genocide with colonization. So in other words, when quote-unquote science started paying attention in, the, in this you know, kind of lockstep way, they're already looking at um, a, a, a profoundly disturbed population psychologically and physiologically and physically, right? So your baseline Absolutely. of inference is well whacked out. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, so the whole issue, which I learned um, in my carnivore, was, was infanticide, even among primates. Now it was a whole big thing of looking at um, monkeys and, and chimpanzees and whatever as the biological basis for human war. Lots of money went into that. Well, a colleague is actually doing a study, and he went through all the data. You know, it was very famous, you know, in the Gombe in, in Africa, in Jane Goodall's area, where they had passion and palm. They were killing other chimpanzees and eating them and stuff like that, and had wars. And it was this sensational kind of, you know, myth-busting thing people were very upset about. It is upsetting. Well, when you look at it, um, what happened is it, all of the, the, the researchers manipulated they manipulated the landscape. They put in banana stations, and it just created chaos. Not only that, and that really wasn't taken into consideration until I started really emphasizing the, the, the concept of psychological trauma, which is also physiological. That whole area is traumatized, right? I mean, with, since colonization, is they've wiped out the, the wildlife. There's been hunting. They've been shooting. They've had all sorts of stuff. So when you're looking 
and, and then the conclusion from my colleague is basically, well, you there is no real robust data which supports that infanticide is normative among primates. There is no substantiating data in science which can say that war, the way we talk about it, this kind of fighting, is quote-unquote natural among non-human primates. So all of this stuff, what you're talking about, is essentially it's science's way of sort of anecdotally fitting in their view of how nature is, which is not true at all, which is Charlie's point. Um, there are cases of the grizzlies and the brown bears killing babies, and he said, I don't really understand. He was in Russia for many years, and he goes, I don't really get it. He said, there's something there. Is there something wrong? But also there's a whole this whole thing about, well, males like lions come in. This is another thing I learned. All of people have made their careers on this. And again, this is not just me saying it. This is scholars telling me who are doing the sort of this retroactive data analysis. They've made their careers on this, that infanticide among lions, infanticide among that. And when you look at it, the data is not there, and it doesn't even make sense. You know, um, you, you know, for example, it, it, it just doesn't even make sense. So the whole setup of science, I would say, post. World War II, because that's when the industry of the our episteme has gotten got fully um, appropriated by the industrial complex, whatever you want to call it. Um, you have some wonderful, like people like Enos Mills, people like John Muir, um, Tin Bergen. Uh, these were people who experienced, and they took their experiences and their observations in much the same way Charlie did. They did not have a worldview picture of how the world works and filling in the dots to make it look like it worked. Um, so again, so much of what we call science, our body of science, is twisted. It's incorrect. Um, the inference is incorrect. And again, which I do want to bring out, is I co coined this term transspecies psychology and when I was doing my doctoral work with elephant PTSD. And the whole point of it was not to start a new field. It was to bring attention to the fact that the entire corpus of biomedical research, on which is derived from quote-unquote animal models, using rats, cats, octopus, monkeys, you name it, in lieu of humans to probe the minds and body, their minds and bodies, to figure out things about humans. All of that is basically goes both ways. What we know about rats, we apply to humans. What we know about humans, we apply to rats. And that is denied. That's the bidirectional inference that I coined that. In other words, what we know about rats, we can apply to humans and vice versa, but it's denied. So you're really looking at a whole engine of defining the way the world is, etc., which is based on false premises. And the, the thing is, is when people say, you know, why aren't you afraid to see a bear? Why should a person say they're afraid of seeing a bear? Where does that come from? I mean, it, you know, that's it. When you push someone, where does it come from? And and you can probably, you know, connect the dots. And there's not probably any person along those dots that told that person or how that person learned about how to be afraid of bears that actually experience being eaten or attacked by a bear. Yeah. I don't know if that went down the right road, but that no, was no, kind no, of it. No, 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 it's, it's, and, uh, so there's nothing, all... you know, I'm trying to say from a very, very conservative science, Western science, and I'm talking about conservative in the sense of it's, with, follows the protocols and everything like that, it's in denial. It's in denial, and it's also based on falsity. And the reason why is because if you start taking those bricks apart, which is what transspecies psychology does, says all, all animals, and I extend it to all beings, which makes sense when you think of just within the very conservative bounds of science, which includes quantum physics, etc., um, all beings are sentient. The rocks are, are sentient. And when you even do it just with what we call animals, you basically are undermining any rationale which justifies our entire fantasy world that we live in. Capitalism, socialism, anything, any ism, with people being superior over animals, superior, whatever. Um, it, it completely undermines it. And so therefore, 
scientists will draw the line, and they basically end up lying. I mean, these are smart people, but they draw the line. And um, we've lost that spirit, and that's why I said, you know, I always say, we need to get, we have, all the educational institutions need to be, you know, re recycled. I mean, I don't think we should even have this social, you know, it's like a conveyor belt. It's just a brainwashing that goes on. And and the book that I wrote, you know, with the Charlie book, was, was an attempt, not just the content, but I really tried hard in terms of, of it as a medium, as much as I could, to have the reader feel like he or she's listening to Charlie and it having to be an experiential um, journey. Because to me, that's where the revitalization needs to happen in terms of our own subjectivity, our own what is real to us. And learning to trust ourselves, you know, you have to be critical. You know, you can't just say, I think I'm right, therefore I am, or I feel, therefore I am. But to learn to have trust in yourself and learn to um, know what is quote-unquote real for you in that way. And to, um, I love the line by Robert Coombs that is unquestioned assumptions are the real authorities of any culture, which is something that you've sort of been hammering at this whole interview. And um, I, I love the notion, this is one of the things that if you really encounter nature, or if you really encounter, I don't want to say nature though, because that's still abstract. If you really encounter a bear, if you really as, as you've said about Charlie, just going, perceiving it as a neighbor. It doesn't matter. A bear, a rat, a pigeon, a tree. If you really just go go and, and say, so what is it like to be you? And as you said earlier about Charlie saying, it's extraordinary they haven't killed us all, that it's extraordinary that when I have asked that question or been able to ask that question or been able to just go and sit with some non-human or even just observe and to 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 try to learn about them for themselves um it's extraordinary how open they are to it and how it's like mm -hmm. you know finally here's a human who actually cares about what i'm thinking or what i'm feeling yeah. and it's it's extraordinary that they are as open as they are so we have like um, seven or eight minutes left, and I'm wondering if before we before we wind down, I'm wondering if you can just tell a couple of of stories of Charlie's encounters, a, a couple of sort of salient stories of of just him encountering uh, a bear. Yeah. If there's any I, specific I'll, stories that you love? Well, there's one that is really extraordinary in the sense of it's as I say in in its ordinariness, but it's extraordinary and. As time goes on, I, I find myself going, you know, kind of like gasping, like getting deeper and deeper dimensions of it. Um, Charlie, just briefly, Charlie in the 90s went to Kamchatka, which is far eastern Russia wilderness, uh, and he was trying to find a place outside of North America, which has been hammered in terms of, of bear slaughter and, and genocide. And so he thought, well, maybe there's this place. Um, and it was fairly well, pretty pristine in the sense of, you know, the Soviet Union, et cetera. Uh, it turned out that there were more poachers there than, than he had imagined. But nonetheless, he ended up staying there for 10 years. And he built a little cabin there, and he left in the winter because it's extremely harsh and the bears uh, hibernate. But um, it was an incredible place, and there's gorgeous pictures in the book of there. And um, these are brown bears, what are cousins of the grizzly bears. They're massive, between 600 and 1,000 pounds and huge and tall, five-foot feathers, stuff like that. Anyway, so he lived there, and unexpectedly, um, I mean, his whole purpose of was going to be there, just to be there and see how the bears responded, um, to, to demonstrate to people that we can live, you know, in peaceful coexistence. And he ended up, um, not he planned, is um, um, adopting, rescuing, and then rearing and reintroducing over the 10-year period 10 um, infant brown bear cubs whose mothers had been shot and killed, and then they were brought to zoos, and he rescued them and brought them and reared them. So he became a mother bear. And early on he met this bear that he named Brandy, who was a female bear, and she was quite formidable. Um, you know, she sort of didn't, you know, didn't take shit from people kind of attitude. And um, what happened is one day she left her cubs 
with him. Um, she sort of just walked by, dumped him there, and went off and did bear things, mama bear things. And, you know, as he describes it, they whimpered at first. It was startling. And then he naturally, <laughs> intuitively fell on his back and waved his arms and legs, and which is what a mother bear would do, and typically they would nurse, but he couldn't do that. And so for seven years, for, um, you know, three sets of cubs over seven years, he became the bear nanny, Brandy's bear nanny. And um, it's it, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, here is this bear. One is she was so perceptive of who Charlie was, and and he, as he said, she was a great teacher. You know, he made some stupid mistakes. You know, as he got caught up, as you had mentioned earlier, you know, he got caught up and you know with the cubs, and he wasn't paying attention that she was fishing, and she got pissed off at him. You know, you know, he wasn't doing right bear manners. But it's really wonderful. I mean, she picked up who he was and I think had a very deep and great care for him and became a mentor. And they had a very close relationship. Um, You can imagine. This is a mother bear. You know, they're supposed to be the most dangerous, you know, creatures on the earth. You know, they'll kill you if you get near their babies. And here she was. She left her, her precious, precious with him. Three sets of cubs. So she not only assessed um, some practical things. I mean, he couldn't be a complete goober. I mean, if, if he wasn't able to do bear-wise things, he could put the cubs in danger. But also her deep appreciation and trust of, of who he was as an individual. So that's one story. Um, and it's it's a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and another one, oh, there's so many. Um, you know, he would just meet a bear. You know, and and you know, it, it's it's like sometimes, you know, I'm sure that everyone has had these moments. could be they just meet a person for a few minutes and something just really clicks and it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. And Charlie had many of those. Um, some of the bears he got to see quite often and developed more deep and, and intimate relationships in terms of getting to know each other. And he said, not all bears like me. I don't like all bears. I mean, it's just like anything else. Um, but he, you know, got to know, and of course the bears that he raised, he had to really get, um, and I talk about this quite extensively, is he couldn't just act like a bear. He had to be a bear, think like a mother bear, and um, in order to be able to teach the young bears. And as he points out, they knew a lot. And he said, I kind of made a mistake thinking, you know, here I am saving these bears. But from, you know, again, from sort of a developmental perspective, you know, he had to be emotionally and cognitively and his consciousness needed to be in such a way that he would um, inculcate them with bareness so that they would be able to learn how to be in bear society according to, you know, wild brown bear mores and ethics and, and, and ways of being. So he got very close, of course, with his babies, you know, who who grew up um, and had extraordinary experience with them and and vice versa. So we're we're pretty much out of time. We have like a minute left. And I guess there's two things I want. I want is one. Can you. I mean, I'm going to say what I think. I hope people take away from the interview. And then if you could say that too, and then if you could also just say a little bit more about how people can find out more about your work. Um, Or actually forget all that. What I want is for you to say what you want people to do in the world. Having having heard this and having uh, having heard this and then having read your book, um, what do you want people to do the next time they see a coyote or the next time they see a, a a mountain lion or a pigeon? Um, just center in love. Um, y- y- you know, you have to realize that, you know, these individuals, I mean, who they are, this is what Charlie would say, is if you see a coyote, it's not coyotes, it's a coyote. You, you would kind of paraphrase that earlier. Who is this? You know, listen and pay attention to who is that person and what's happening for them. And it's learning how to tune in in that way. Um, You know, that's why Charlie was able to live. I mean, he could tell if a bear was in a, 
you know, was in a bad mood or, or something was going on. I mean, they have lives other than being, you know, fixtures on a on a you know, on a stage that amuse us. They have th- they have a job. They have things that happen to them, and so I guess what I would say is really tune in and approach with an open heart and and love, um, not the kind of Disneyland kind of love, but in the love of acceptance and and openness and appreciation and not to look at them as a wolf uh, or as a coyote. Understand their wolfness, understand their bareness, understand their coyoteness or doveness or pigeonness, but try to connect as much as possible to really what lies beyond form. Well, thank you so much for all that, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Gabe Bradshaw. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. Oh, my God.